Europe has a rich and deeply rooted religious heritage. Its unique buildings, tranquil spaces and exquisite artifacts encompass the diversity of European culture and identity. This religious heritage is an invaluable resource that is handed over to us for all generations to enjoy. It is all around us and an integral part of our lives and communities. It includes rich cultural traditions, masterpieces of art, wonderful craftsmanship and extraordinary music. In an era of globalization, cultural heritage helps us to remember our European cultural diversity and its understanding develops mutual respect and contributes to dialogue amongst different cultures. The future of religious heritage presents us with challenges and opportunities. Knowledge transfer and innovation will be needed to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations. From the creative reuse of historic buildings to educational opportunities, from both real and virtual tourism to strengthening communities, the value of religious heritage is almost limitless. It is up to us to make the most of its potential. Since 2011, Future for Religious Heritage, a European network, has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non-faith, not-for-profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. Join us now. This was the call from the FRH Europe and you all have followed this call and are here with us today at Kloster Michaelstein, Michaelstein in Saxony, Anhalt. Buongiorno, bonjour, buenos dias, gen dobre, willkommen and welcome to this third of four FRH conferences this year. On your screens, at home and here at the monastery. The overall topic of all four for FRH conferences is continuity. And this very event today is about continuity in evolving cultural expressions. What is meant by that? Well, within the next two hours, we will find out. My name is Hilde Wieck. I am a journalist and have the honor of accompanying you through this conference until uh, 5 p.m. as part of the 10th anniversary conference marathon, so to say, of uh, FRH celebrations. But first of all, uh, it is, of course, the honor to Pilar Barmond, who is the president of FRH, to welcome us all. Here she is. Dear conference participants, as president of Future for Religious Heritage, it is an honor to welcome you in FRH 10th year anniversary to our third and penultimate hybrid conference event, straight from the amazing religious heritage of the German city of Blankenberg, Michelstein Abbey. Today's conference follows the successful first and second events in Barcelona, Spain, and Bologna, Italy, on the continuity in function or use and the continuity in community and dialogue. Respectively, in both events, members and non-members, all participants, contributed actively, showing an active attendance and lively participants in the chat as well. These four hybrid events take place under the framework of the general conference theme Europe's Living Religious Heritage, as part of the EU Creative Europe project Europe Connect a living heritage that contains and treasures, treasures up the identity of Europe and it is our task to perpetuate it amongst the citizenship. I am pleased to reiterate that this new format is allowing so many people from all corners of Europe and beyond to join in without travelling. We will aim to create hybrid online sessions for all our activities. We are more than 70 institutions and more than 100 professionals and experts from 38 countries. For those amongst us today, who are not members yet, I hope today's event might inspire you to join, we can create an even more stronger voice of religious heritage in Europe. Now, this conference event that we are about to start focuses on continuity in evolving cultural expressions. It addresses the question of how continuity can be achieved in the cultural use of religious places, how such continuity can be defined and which actors and supporters are necessary to achieve it. To this end, 
We are guests today at a place that has found a very specific form of such continuity, the former Meikenstein Monastery in the state of Saxony Anhalt in Germany. This region stands for a very special situation within Germany. Less than 20% of the population is still a member of a Christian church, and yet this landscape is characterized by a special density of churches and monasteries. It is astonishing that these religious buildings are still highly valued, that the population stands up for these buildings and does not want to see them deteriorate or demolished under any circumstances. Not only the churches or religious communities do advocate the preservation of the buildings by looking for innovative uh, concepts for supplementing their use. Moreover, they are also associated with state and municipal administrations, with the monument preservation authorities and civic initiatives in these goals as well. I am pleased that in a few minutes and for two hours, participants with different levels of implication in the preservation of religious cultural heritage are entering into the discussion from the general director of the Kulturstiftung Sassenhalt to the representatives of associations that support cultural initiatives throughout Germany and Europe. FRH is particularly pleased and honored to welcome Ms. Sabine Berhayen, member of the European Parliament and chair of the Committee on Culture and Education, who carries written in her heart culture and is very supportive to the sector as a whole and cultural heritage in capital letters. As you know, this event is streaming live from Michael Stein Abbey in Blankenburg, Guten Tag, Germany. I would like to thank the participation and support of Stefan Weyer, member of the Council of FRH and chair of the board of Klosterland EV and the moderator, Hilde Will, who is journalist and presenter. The distinguished hosts too, Dr. Christian Philipsen, director general of the Cultural Foundation Kulturstiftung Sachsen-Anhalt, FRH member Professor Dr. Harald Schwillers, Director of the Institute for Catholic Theology and Here Didactic der Martin Luther uh, Universitat, Halle Wittenberg, and the distinguished panelists. Connecting online, Ms. Sabine Berhayen, member of the European Parliament and Chair of the Committee on, on Culture and Education, as we said, Hans Langwein, President of Society for Contemporary Art and the Church Artheon, and Director of Foundation Stiftung St. Matthaus, and Stefan Bayer, um, FRH Council Member and Chair of the Board of uh, Klosterland. I would also like to give special thanks, very special thanks too, to every member of Working Group Z for their enormous preparatory work, as well as its coordinator and FRH member, Jan Jaspers, for their amazing effort, inspiration and commitment to the theme based on their input that gathers us together today. And again, as their peers of groups A, B and D, for their enormous flexibility to adapt constantly and repeatedly to the numerous changes in format over the past one year and a half. Dear all, we all share the same aim. We want to preserve religious heritage. Engaging and awareness raising are ones of FRH aims. Connecting and building bridges with the younger generation is considered very important. Therefore, I am very pleased to share with you the last week the launch of Run for Heritage, our campaign to raise awareness of the importance of religious heritage among the younger generation throughout fun outdoor activities that promote healthy habits while allowing young Europeans to learn about the history and cultural richness of their village, town and region. It was very successful. Hundreds of school children participated in the first of seven events in northern Spain. FRH is working to organize many more all over Europe. Handing over this marvelous heritage to future generations is a responsibility of us all. All of us gathered here today know we can only do that together. So thank you and I wish you all a great conference and look forward to meeting you again in our next event on the 26th of November in Brussels, the heart of the European Union this year. And for those who are not members yet, this might be an excellent opportunity to join us. To cooperate, please check the Run for Heritage initiative in FRH website and don't hesitate to bring your town, village or city to this activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pilar Barmont. Uh, this was a great laying out of the carpet for today's conference here at uh, Michaelstein. And to introduce you to this place, we have prepared a little video show that uh, can show you how uh, these buildings, um, what, what the atmosphere of these buildings are. Here we go.
have flown over Michael Stein, but now we will introduce the person you have seen already for a short time on screen, Mr. Dr. Christian uh, Philipson, who is, so to say, the CEO of this great place, uh, among other places. And we will switch to him now to receive his greeting as a host at this place. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues in front of the screens all over Europe, I'm very happy to welcome you here in Michaelstein. This conference takes place in one of the 18 monuments that belong to the cultural foundation of Saxony-Anhalt. Among these treasures, you can find monasteries and cathedrals, as well as castles and palaces, but also the Moritzburg, the Art Museum of Saxony-Anhalt. In this way, our foundation exemplifies 1,200 years of history and the cultural heritage of central Germany. We are very honored that one of the four conferences of Future for Religious Heritage is broadcasted from Michaelstein. And my thanks go to Professor Harald Schwillus. He applied that this event is held in Germany, especially in Saxony-Anhalt. In addition, I would like to thank Stefan Bayer that in cooperation with Klosterland, the choice fell on Michaelstein. With the image trailer, we just received a first impression of this unique place. Michaelstein Abbey, I think, is the right location for a conference on future for religious heritage because this place had to invent a new future again and again throughout the last 900 years. First, it was a Cistercian monastery, then after Reformation, um, a Protestant school. In the 18th century, a Lutheran seminary. After French occupation, it became an agricultural estate. And then after World War II, a shelter for fugitives. And since the 17th, a place for research on Baroque music. When this conference deals with concepts for the subsequent use of religious buildings um, that are appropriate and dignified, I think here in Michaelstein we found such a use. Today the monastery is the Music Academy of Saxony-Anhalt and I think a monastery music education is a very good connection. Now I'm looking forward for the further discussion, for the results of the projects and on the tables, and I thank you very much for joining us in Michaelstein. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Philipson. And um, we will see more of him later on the panel that we have. But um, now we received the second greeting from Harald Schwillos, who is member of the uh, advisory committee of the FRH. The Professor Schwillos, now. Good afternoon to all. I'm very happy to have you here and that we are here in this wonderful surroundings in that wonderful building that you can see only in the detail on the screen. I'm very happy and feel very, very proud that FRH decided to produce this broadcast at Michaelstein Abbey in Germany. This former Cistercian monastery, situated not far away from the university city of Halle, is an inspiring place for this meeting. It illustrates in a perfect way the ongoing change of religious heritage in Germany and whole Europe. Situated in the center of the German state Saxony-Anhalt, in German Sachsen-Anhalt, you may see it as an example for use and reuse of a monastery during the centuries. Today, it serves as a museum and a music school and houses a small Protestant church too. In the Middle Ages, this part of Germany was very, very famous for its large amount of monastery of different orders. However, due to the Reformation in the 16th century, the majority of them had been dissolved. In that way, the history of the Lutheran Reformation is also a part of the religious heritage of this area. Wittenberg, where Martin Luther lived and worked, is nowadays a part of Saxony Anhalt II. In my research work at the Institute for Catholic Theology 
and its education at the Martin Luther University in Halle-Wittenberg. I'm deep involved in questions of communicating and explaining the richness of the buildings and the religious heritage in Saxony, Anhalt, Germany, and whole Europe. My special thanks go to Mr. Philipson, the Director General of this institution, that we can stay here. As a co-organizer and a co-host of this conference, I'm curious about the following discussions and results. All the best. Thank you. Professor Harald Schwillus, we will see him later again when he introduces a garden project to us. And by the way, I have just learned that the sound system of the Zoom uh, channel does not work right now. So if possible, switch to the YouTube channel. The link is provided by the office at uh, Brussels Bureau of FRH, Jordi Malarak. And uh, I hope that you can all participate with images and with the video and the sound system, of course. So let me mention at this uh, stage that you can participate via YouTube channel also with the chat function. So if you want to comment or ask questions alongside, please don't hesitate to do that. I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to mention it because we are very tight with our schedule, so probably there is not um, much time to discuss. But if you have questions, Jordi Malarek, thanks Jordi, will have an eye on that and uh, can give us a signal that you have um, questions um, that we can maybe refer to along the way. Thank you for that and I hope you all have the sound system working um, in the meantime. But now the stage is set for our panel of this afternoon. Uh, so uh, you see some of the atmosphere here. Actually, the place where we are now has been the former barn of uh, the monastery. And I hope that we harvest some of uh, good <laughs> information and uh, some good discussions in this environment. Um, joining us digitally will be Sabine Fahoyen. She has been uh, a little bit... Um, uh, um, well, I won't say attacked, but uh, she, her way to the Webex uh, place has been um, uh, uh, hindered by the storm, so stormy effects. Um, uh, but she will join us later on. She is member of the Committee of Culture and Education at the European Parliament, works for the CDU, that is the Christian Democratic Union, part of the EPP, the European People's Party. But she also studied architecture herself and we can assume some expertise and interest for the subject matter with her. But we'll come back to her later on when she is online and can join us here. Now, who else is on this panel? We uh, saw Dr. Christian uh, Philipson already as the host. Um, but let me uh, just um, add to his introduction in his institution, 160 people work for the foundation um, to maintain and safeguard 1,200 years of history. And the uh, variety of buildings that uh, he deals with is really very interesting because uh, it is six palaces, five castles, four cathedrals, one church and a monastery, including the Art Museum Moritzburg in Halle, which is a re uh, internationally renowned um, art institution also, and the unique Lionel Feininger Gallery at Quedlinburg, with its medieval center being a UNESCO World Heritage Site. All that is really here in the vicinity of this place. Um, and yes, the cathedrals are under state administration too. Uh, that is quite a unique situation for you to host both types of heritage under your roof. So, um, hello, Dr. Philipson, and uh, welcome um, Stefan Bayer, who is uh, FRH uh, committee member and council member also, and um, also the um, chair of the board of Klosterland uh, uh, League. Together with Harald Schwillus, he has been the pillar for all organizational work around the event today. 
Stefan Bay is also the director of the museum at Lenin Monastery. So we have a lot of expertise on monasteries in this room. Uh, and he is a specialist on the history of Cistercian order, as well as on use and reuse of religious buildings. With the Klosterland League, he manages to connect 22 monasteries so far throughout Germany, which shows his expertise in networking on a national and international level too. So welcome, Stefan Bayer. Thank you. <laughs> Last not least, Hannes Langbein, he is a pastor, president of the Society for Contemporary Art and the Church Atheon, and director of the Foundation St. Matthews of Berlin, Brandenburg, Obere Lausitz, a branch of the Protestant Church. He is curator of various art exhibitions within his church, for example, last year on Joseph Beuys. And he knows about the special history of churches in this region as well as places of political and societal revolution in the former GDR. So churches here have had special roles and um, special place in society as well. So hello, Hannes Langbein. Hello. Um, I found a quote on the page on of your foundation, which really is a wonderful introduction to what we will encounter uh, as the next discussions, and which relates uh, to the FRH goals and to this event. So I quote, Since its beginnings, the church has lived in a close relationship with the arts. At the same time, the church itself is part of the culture of its time. It cannot do without dialogue and understanding of the culture that surrounds it. The church buildings and the church music are living exper expressions of the formative cultural power of the church. In dialogue with artists, the church is inspired to find a language that testifies to the reality of God in the world and stimulates critical reflection and a broad view of the world. So that really is uh, the layout for this conference and matches wonderfully with the um, results of the uh, Group C workings, the pre-conference working group. Well, just to mention it, uh, of course, churches are not the uh, only subjects the FRH deals with, but um, it is just an amazing figure for all of those who are not very familiar with our FRH as uh, as an organization. In total, there are more than 600,000 places of worship of any kind throughout Europe. And any single one could potentially be in danger. And therefore, we have uh, a lot of discussion about, well, what can cultural expressions be? How can this wonderful heritage be um, guided into present and also into the future. And now we will listen to the co-chair of the FRH com conference committee, Jan Jasper. He coordinated the pre-conference working group C that met three times, I'm, I guess. And he has prepared important aspects for this conference on the evolving cultural expressions. And we listen to his results now. So the third uh, working group um, was about continuity in evolving cultural ex expressions. We had uh, uh, three meetings um, previous to this uh, uh, event, this average event. We discussed this topic in the in these three um, meetings, and uh, we were talking about uh, what can be the meaning of uh, evolving cultural expressions. Uh, in uh, the case of uh, the, the religious heritage. And we defined three uh, main aspects uh, related to this topic. The first topic is about uh, knowledge of your heritage. We call it know your heritage. So when you want to undertake actions regarding the movable and intangible heritage, both are important connected to religious heritage is in great, of a great importance to know your, your heritage. And therefore, uh, we advise to start making inventories of this movable heritage. That means you start with a good description and uh, you put it in a, in a digital format. This digital format has the advantage that you can exchange the information also between countries. 
and therefore the group advised uh, towards the FRH to realize an European Europe-wide simple basic system that can easily be used by the volunteers of places of worship and uh, maybe in the second stage connect these different places of uh, worship and their treasures. We also think that it's important to give a special attention to the heritage that's connected to the music and musical traditions. That means we think that in archives of many places of worship, interesting musical information uh, uh, is uh, available. Manuscripts, scores, but also uh, information about the musical life related to the worshiping. And uh, certainly when you talk about reuse of uh, this heritage, this uh, immovable heritage, then archives are very vulnerable uh, in the context, in this context. And maybe at risk. So we think it's also important to uh, safeguard these archives and uh, look what is possible to do in the future with this, what we call sounding heritage. This sounding heritage is not only this is manuscripts, but also the organs and other musical instruments. For instance, also the bells that are related to the towers of the uh, religious uh, heritage. What do you do with this uh, uh, with these bells when the uh, the heritage is not no longer used for worshiping? And then we also think that uh, religious um, communities cherish traditions and practices connected to to their religion and when the, the the community disappears this maybe these traditions also uh, tend to disappear so it's important also to document them and save information about them for the future the second topic is about education when the the religious practice and and so on is um, is uh, fading away then uh, all the information about it is no longer transformed or, or uh, transposed from one generation to the other one. So it's also important to educate not only young people about the significance of this heritage, but also uh, people that are involved, for instance, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in tourism, in uh, educational uh, tours and so on. Young people, uh, uh, people of all generations uh, are involved in this uh, in this problem and an important target target group we think is also the politicians on every political level uh, from local to international they have to know the importance of this heritage because the decision that they take uh, regarding this heritage is very important to the for the future of this heritage and the last topic is about the creation of new heritage for tomorrow. I think that we, we received this heritage from the previous generation in order to pass it through the next generation. And the previous generation always enriched the heritage. They added new things, new sculptures, stained glass and so on. They decorated the, the houses of worship uh, uh, according to, to new uh, tendencies uh, and so on and we think that this has, doesn't have to stop with our generation we have also we must also add new layers to this religious heritage so and therefore we must engage good artists of all kinds but also good architects when we think about the reuse of this uh, this uh, religious heritage because they put very visible new layers to this religious heritage Thank you very much. And thank you, Jan Jasper from Michael Stein. Uh, and he um, has done a terrific work with his working group C with a pre-conference work and sparks the first round of discussion now here in this um, music hall, uh, transformed music hall. And I would like to pick up the suggestion of uh, Jan Jasper to say, art artists should come in and we have uh, we are, it's not our duty only to preserve um, heritage but also to interpret 
in our times and now artists really come into the picture and I look at Hannes Langwein with this because you in your Stiftung and with St. Matthäus on many levels you deal with art and the church uh, and religious art and not religious art in religious places. Um, as I mentioned you had the Josef Beuys uh, installation and Ausstellung last year and uh, um, mentioned some discussion on that in the church. So how do you, in your place of work, um, combine the two, church and art and interpretation of the spirit? Well, yes, I think um, Jan Jaspers made a very important point, um, talking about the um, artists as uh, people who help us to actually uh, get further with our religious um, heritage. Um, We are in um, our church in the middle of Berlin, as you uh, said. We are um, at the Berlin Kulturforum, um, right next to the New National Gallery and the Picture Gallery and the Philharmonics. And uh, so, um, in a way, just um, through the space, uh, through, um, the place we are working at, we are in a continuous dialogue um, with the arts. When I came into office, I um, actually uh, came over um, a quote that has become quite important for me by the French uh, sociologist uh, Bruno Latour. And he actually said, uh, whoever um, stops to translate, stops to preserve. So uh, whenever you want to preserve something, you actually have to get into a translation modus and um, bring the tradition you are dealing with, of course, into new forms. And um, obviously, um, we are doing this with um, the contemporary artists in our church. We invite um, musicians, we invite uh, poets, we invite uh, sculptors and painters um, uh, in um, order to bring them into contact with our living tradition. I mean, it's still a living tradition. We are still a church, um, even though we are doing exhibitions and concerts and everything. Um, culture institution would do. We are a culture found foundation, but uh, we are still a living church and we basically bring artists in contact with this tradition, invite them, for example, to uh, reformulate a biblical psalm. We have a worship tradition called Mein Psalm, My Psalm, and um, every time uh, we have this worship, there is a poet coming, um, reinventing basically. Um, uh, a biblical psalm and uh, then this is part of the worship or we uh, invite artists uh, to participate in our liturgy or create um, images um, for the altar. There is a long tradition now um, uh, which is called das andere Altarbild, the other alternative altar picture and um, we um, basically bring ourselves in the situation that as a religious community we have to um, well cope with the artistic impulses that um, arrive in our in our church space and um, uh, of course um, once you do that um, changes uh, come with it and not only for the space but also for the religious life suddenly people sit differently and of course the questions come up yeah. uh, what's happening here and is this still a church yes Okay, we'll discuss that question uh, on a later discussion, later point of this discussion. And I would like to focus on your uh, institution now, uh, Dr. Philipson, with a heterogeneous uh, set of buildings, palaces, churches, cathedrals even. Um, well, how can you change the heritage um, that you see? I mean, th this place is a good example how it can work, but you are responsible for many institutions like for the dome of magdeburg the cathedral of magdeburg where uh, the um, ch uh, masses take place so the church uses the place but you are responsible for the building and so how does that work in your responsibility um, yeah of course we are responsible for the buildings for four cathedrals um, you asked about the change of the places obviously for our um, foundation. This is the second question. Not the, the main question is uh, how to protect it and how to preserve it. Because uh, our by our charter we are we have the duty to protect and to preserve the um, substance of the building um, and the monument. Uh, this is the main goal of our foundation. 
um, changing uses and creating a new heritage um, sometimes happens, of course, but has to be uh, has to base on the protection idea for our institution. Um, and in this way, I would like to refer to uh, to other um, aspects of Jan Jasper because he said um, to deal with the um, religious heritage, you have to to know the heritage. Um, and you have to do education to understand it. And this is for us a main a aspect in our work. Um, research is the base for uh, our um, maintenance of the buildings. Of course, you have to know a building when you start restoration, for example. And um, we have um, the task uh, to explain and de to develop the buildings, of course, by education. For example, here Michael Stein is a very good example. Michael Stein is a um, music academy, a modern music academy with a very innovative um, museum on music history, but it is located in an old monastery with a special atmosphere, especially in the cloister. And people, visitors who come here, feel this tension between the modern use and the medieval religious heritage and atmosphere in the building. And this is what we have to explain. This is why our um, education programs, for example, here in Michael Stein, focus on um, the m time when Michael Stein was a monastery, um, focus on daily life and belief in the monastery, focus on the monastery gardens, because this place had, has to be explained in educational programs. knows what uh, Dr. Philipson is talking about as uh, chair of the <laughs> Klosterland uh, with 22 institutions under your roof. Um, so how, what do you, what inspires you from what we have heard from Jan Jasper? Um, is it the art aspect or is it the education or maintenance and know your heritage? Um, I would say uh, for, for Klosterland, we have a, a very wide uh, sea on, 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 the, uh, uh, on, the, on the on the world uh, uh, protecting um, heritage. The, the Klosterland Association, uh, which is active not only in Germany, but also in the western part of Poland, has um, as task to communicate the heritage of the monasteries in a wide way. Uh, and to make it visible for uh, the today, today's society. Um, therefore, we call the legacy of monasteries um, the monastery culture at all. For us, that means um, to understand the way to, li to live um, in Christian orders as a religious expression of, of the old slogan, uh, pray and work, uh, in Latin, ora et labora. Um, this indicates that not only prayer and spiritual life uh, is an expression of religion, also agricultural work, arts and crafts, education, charity and so on are expressions of spirituality uh, in, in, in monasteries. Um, so a monastery represents, represents, of course, a whole world uh, like in a nutshell. And uh, that means that uh, one can see in a monastic community the life as it is in general. Um, regarding this wide interpretation of monastic uh, le religious legacy, there are many opportuni opportunities for continuing that perspective of monastic culture even in former monasteries. Um, Many former monasteries are now cultural centers for a region or so on. Concerts take place there, museums or libraries um, are housed there. All these uses are of course compatible with these buildings. But I think there is another question. Um, are people visiting a concert, um, a museum, a library? Uh, they understand where they are, that's the question. Um, and so we uh, want to communicate also uh, the 
the, the history of the uh, buildings and of the monasteries as a part of the modern time too. Okay, so uh, I, what, I, what I understood is that most of the uh, monasteries that you care, take care of uh, are in a rural area uh, and uh, in the, well, East Germany, uh, next to Poland or reaching out to the Polish uh, rural areas on the other side of the Oder. And um, uh, is, is it possible to, to draw attention to these places on a larger scale? Um, or is it something that has an effect on the community in the vicinity? That's, uh, I can say that it's not only, we have not only um, uh, monasteries in rural areas, uh, not in the biggest cities, I would say, but also in, in, in the center of, uh, of uh, smaller cities. And uh, I think um, all that monasteries have a deep contact to the communities, also in the, in the bigger cities, yeah. Also, not so big, other, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, in, in cities too, yeah. But I think that that is a, a topic that really is uh, of great interest to all uh, uh, all monastery places or, or religious places throughout uh, Europe and beyond, to to um, to ask themselves the question: How can we attract attention before you educate people? They must come to this place. <laughs> I don't know how you manage to get people to Michelstein, but um, yeah, you need some some kind of attraction. One needs to be um, present in the minds of the people. And um, I'm glad to illustrate to you, uh, as part of this conference, a garden project um, which will be presented by Harald Schwillers, whom we have met before. And um, he has worked on monastery gardens as an example to attract tourism into these uh, regions and also to the exact places and sites. And it is also a, a, a joint venture, Polish and German um, project and research project. And here is uh, the presentation. I would like to present today the main aspects of a research project I conducted at the Martin Luther University Halle-Wittenberg as principal investigator in collaboration with Markus Globisch as head of my research group. It is entitled Monastery Gardens and Spiritual Tourism, a comparative potential analysis of locations in Germany and Poland, and was granted by FRH for presentation at this conference. Monasteries and especially their gardens are trending in touristic developments. The gardens of Cistercian monasteries, both formerly and living, are no exception. They are increasingly visited within the framework of so-called spiritual tourism. People coming there expect mostly special places that are elevated from everyday life. Seen over all, the offers with the label of spiritual tourism are very diverse, especially monasteries due to their history their architectural and geographical features, and not lastly due to their gardens, have a distinctive aura, giving them a unique selling proposition to implement their potential for spiritual tourism into concrete proportions. All these observations lead to a research question about monastic gardens and spiritual tourism. How do monasteries understand and use their gardens in the context of this touristic development? A question such as this fits into my research profile, interested in spiritual tourism and in the communication of religion and the cultural public. Cyprian Nogowski from the University of Warmia and Missouri was acquired as a Polish cooperation partner for this research project, since he also deals with similar questions in his contextual framework. Four locations were researched in this pilot study three of them in Germany and one in Poland. Marianowo Monastery in Poland, nowadays used as a parish church. In Germany, Michaelstein Abbey, nowadays a museum with reconstructed medieval monastic gardens. Lindo Monastery, nowadays a Protestant convent with its Garden des Buches, Garden of the Book, with plants of the Bible and the Koran. Langwaden Monastery, Nowadays, a still-living Cistercian monastery 
with its gardens used by monastic communities and its guests. On this basis, an empirical research project was developed that conducts a comparative analysis of the monastic gardens at the chosen monastery locations and their existing potential for spiritual tourism as well as for touristic networking. Methodically, this happens through so-called guided expert interviews conducted with persons responsible for their monastic gardens. The method of triangulation and the framework of grounded theory methodology forms the scientific background of this research project. There are already four interesting results of the research project so far. First, in all locations the gardens are ascribed a high, if not existential, meaning for the monastic location. Second, locations that are operated by non-church institutions offer mostly implicit proposals for spiritual tourism. Monasteries in which monastic communities still live, on the other hand, do not want to be touristic locations because this contradicts their comprehension of spirituality. Therefore, networking between different monastery locations has to be aware of these different needs and frameworks, if it shall be successful. Third, the experts of all locations interpret spiritual tourism especially as a social interaction. The report of conversations with visitors or conversations between visitors themselves in which spirituality plays an elevated role, despite the very different institutional frameworks at the locations. This displays that for some of these visitors a monastery is always going to be spiritually meaningful, independently from its institutional responsibility or topical focus. The basis for this are stimulating offers of mostly simpler content that consider the different prior knowledge and needs of the guests. Fourth, experts on location, both religiously bound and secular providers, understand spiritual tourism mostly in the sense of a spiritual voyage, like pilgrimage, search for quietness, reflection, spiritual experiences, and so on. Other forms of spiritual tourism, like the so-called religious tourism, are not or not so often interpreted as part of this travel form. Religious tourism as a travel form means that the explanation of a religious site, like a monastery garden, as a monument of history or geography, should include always its religious meaning in the sense of a cultural knowledge. The research project shows that there is a large potential for communicating and protecting the heritage of monastery gardens in Europe. All right, so far about the garden project where again Michael Stein, Michael Stein is involved and we could see the image of it. Now, tourism probably is uh, a very um, well, well known and of course attractive field of engagement for conservation uh, in your sense as well. But um, is it is it, um, as we have heard, it probably is problematic and contradicts the actual working orders of Cistercian, for example, Cistercian um, um, monks um, who live there and who do not want a lot of attention and traffic. So is tourism something that is um, a good goal for, for uh, monasteries who are working? Can that be a solution? to draw attention in that way? I ask. Monastery, it is uh, worth to, to develop also tourism. But indeed, it's a problem also for, uh, especially for the communities of monks or nurses um, uh, to, to have uh, both uh, goals, to have many tourists as a place and to have uh, quietness uh, to live there. And uh, it's, it's always uh, a challenge to to separate both to have that and to have that it's sometimes not so easy we have a, a very interesting um, um, uh, example uh, at the Neuzelle Abbey uh, it's a, mo a former monastery 
um, nearby the uh, river Oder, uh, near to Poland. And uh, there was uh, the idea to re-establish a new um, community of Cistercians there. And uh, they decided uh, to, to live nearby the monastery, not inside of the uh, historical buildings, because they need their quietness and they, need, they have other goals, not only the touristical. All right. Um, yeah, and I have just learned that uh, Sabine Verheyen is with us now. Uh, I think she managed to uh, survive the traffic and all the, uh, um, the in-betweens, the stormy weather, um, and uh, she finally reached a safe place where she can yeah, switch on and be online. Uh, so can we talk to Sabine Verheyen? Is she now available on screen? I ask the technicians here. I yes. can see you and I can hear you. So oh, perhaps you can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wonderful. We are very happy that you survived the trip from Brussels to back to Germany. Um, actually to attend a party meeting um, uh, this weekend in Nordrhein-Westfalen in your home area. So uh, let me shortly introduce you. We're, we're very happy to have you with us here since you are um, for, I think this is the third period of EU Parliament um, uh, participation on your part. And of course you are a citizen, you have been raised in Aachen which is mm -hmm. a city that is um, a symbol for European tradition and culture, the seat of Charlemagne, and you have studied architecture. So we assume that you have great interest in the, um, all the goals of the FRH, of course. And since you are uh, the chairwoman of the um, uh, Ausschuss Committee on Culture and Education of Cult in Brussels, of course, for two years now, we are very keen to learn from you, maybe as a beginning, um, how these matters uh, of heritage are being discussed in that, in that um, committee. Is that mm. a part? Are you recognizing the, the, the needs of this field? Absolutely. I think it is very important. Uh, and that was also shown in the year 2018 when we had the European Year of Cultural Heritage, where especially also our religious heritage sites uh, played a special role. Um, I think it is important uh, to know your roots, to know where you come from, your basis. And that's also not just shown by the content, by the um, uh, 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 the um, uh, non uh, um, non material heritage uh, but uh, it's also shown uh, by our cultural heritage sites like uh, monasteries like churches uh, like symbols of our religious traditions uh, but also events uh, that uh, still take place uh, which are historical or traditional uh, religious events um, I think what, what is discussed already by um, by, by uh, the colleagues here uh, in in, the mon in in your monastery uh, is that um, uh, tourism is a kind of keeping these uh, uh, cultural heritage places alive. That's one aspect, but I think it must be more than than just tourism because uh, uh, it is our common value. It has to be supported also uh, by the European Union to set up networks between uh, these religious heritage sites, between monasteries, between uh, uh, the nuns and, and uh, uh, monks that are living still in, in, in these monasteries and to um, elaborate common solutions or uh, possibilities, not just for let's say the normal kind of tourism we all know, but also to open up the monasteries uh, for people who are searching for something else than just visiting a cultural heritage site, um, but uh, also finding a place uh, to go back uh, to their own spirituality. And I think that is also a chance uh, for developments in the future where um, monasteries can open up um, in a different way than just tourism. Uh, to visitors. Uh, uh, we see that in, in many of the monasteries, also in the region where I do come from, uh, that they offer uh, um, um, a kind of, of uh, um, 
of 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 days for uh, for sp uh, spiritual days where people can reflect uh, on on their life on their uh, values on their work on uh, also questions like work life balance also uh, on their on their own position towards religion and uh, to find themselves and perhaps also to find God back. But uh, I think it is um, uh, dif different. Uh, uh, we have different approaches. We see that all over Europe, uh, that uh, especially for um, uh, uh, religious heritage sites, uh, it's always difficult also to find the balance between the classical tourism visitors who just want to to take a look to the building to the to the site itself but uh, i think what uh, uh, differs from uh, other cultural heritage sites with religious heritage uh, there is a special aspect too that we have places um, also for um, uh, um, for 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 meditation for finding yourself for spirituality and i think that is a different approach we have especially to elaborate also on the european level for these sites Thank you very much, Sabine Fahayen. And if I may mention that in preparation for this conference, I have learned from actually from the work from FRH, uh, thanks to the INFORM uh, work where you have gathered and uh, uh, brought together so many figures. So know your heritage, here you are. Uh, the FRH INFORM um, uh, summary is really impressive. And I just quote, in the EU, five countries own three quarters of the places of worship and under these five among Italy, France, Germany and Spain is Romania. And now if you represent uh, in your committee the culture of Europe, I ask myself how can Romania <laughs> be represented in, in such a field and talking about tourism as an example, um, it, it is, you know, what what are the concepts in a country like that or in other countries uh, this um, Germany is very well has a good infrastructure to reach places but um, maybe there are needs to to reach out to places in Romania um, who are very remote and who do, do not have public transport I wonder just if with a um, I hope with a short answer um, do you reflect that in your committee are there um, people who stand up for churches in Romania or for places of worship? Surely we do. First, it is important to see that we uh, work together with other committees uh, to uh, raise funds and uh, possibilities uh, for R Romania uh, to set up infrastructure also under the aspect of uh, reach out to cultural heritage sites. Um, that is what we did in a common report uh, uh, between uh, Regi and, and the cult committee that uh, uh, we tried to implement also in the regional development funds the aspect of cultural heritage and um, accessibility of cultural heritage when it comes to infrastructure. So there are possibilities also from European side to support that. But what must be said uh, also very clearly is that uh, mainly the member states are responsible to set up the operational programs uh, for this work. And um, uh, so uh, there is, I think, a lot to do, especially in countries where you have many, many things uh, that have to develop and have to, to go forward uh, to set priorities. But I think um, uh, it is important not to forget the cultural side um, and uh, perhaps also the, um, um, the fund uh, that is set up now as recovery should also uh, ta uh, be taken partly for the recovery also of cultural heritage and cultural heritage sites. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine Hayen. Um, I would like to come back to the example of art in churches um, and uh, maybe even the, the parish church of uh, St. Matthews. Um, you just mentioned there probably are sometimes some side effects of uh, drawing attention to places that probably are not in line with the interests of <laughs> of uh, of churches or of religious places. And um, as you have mentioned, there is religious, um, there is a place with a religious spirituality or who attracts people who have other goals than maybe just just tourists who need, well, who want to maybe have other goals than that. Um, 
as an example, um, with the with the Joseph Beuys discussion you had last year, um, what did you experience? What were the effects if you attract attention to a place uh, with means that are not uh, in the direct line of religious interpretations or religious um, interests? Well, it's different um, experiences. Uh, I mean, of course, um, if you um, do have these dif different branches in one place, uh, worship life, and on the other hand, um, art exhibitions, which of course also connects to a kind of tourism then, people are coming for the arts, then uh, different groups of course come together and there are situations of course when um, there are probably comparable problems like in a monastery, uh, you have people who want to uh, be in a, a silent place, uh, who want to participate in a noon meditation uh, and at the same time there is a group of people coming to see Joseph Beuys. Of course this uh, can be a problem but I um, would also say that um, it is actually a very um, interesting situation which we actually want to have because um, we actually want to attract different groups of society um, in this certain place and bring them in contact with um, with art and religious life. Um, I mean, um, uh, talking about uh, people leaving churches, um, usually they say it's it's not uh, it's not because of the high church taxes or things like this, um, but it's because they just don't have any contact at all anymore uh, to religious life. Uh, and in a way, um, uh, if people are coming to uh, see exhibitions in, in our church, of course, at the, there is the side effect coming in contact with religious life. We, uh, for example, um, had a series of noon meditations inviting the um, Berliner Ensemble, the, the theater house in Berlin, um, doing uh, the noon meditations with us. And um, then, of course, many people came who never really um, participated in a worship and some people said, well, now they're only coming for the actors. Um, and uh, th this may be true, um, but at the same time, it's also a chance. And um, I, feel, um, I feel like we should develop these chances. Right. Is it uh, the opinion of the other two, too, of this panel? I mean, uh, well, if I would paraphrase it, I would say um, it doesn't matter where the money comes from as long as the people come in <laughs> or spend some time there. Um, is it the least um, common um, factor? Uh, would you share that point of view, um, if I put it a little provokingly? I think for us, in, it's in some places the other way around. Um, for example, Magdeburg, the cathedral of Magdeburg probably is the main tourist interest of the city. People come to Magdeburg for visiting uh, the cathedral, like, I don't know, 300, 400,000 people a year. And um, so uh, there is already a tourist, tourism interest and the church uh, can use it and uses this interest for their um, things and for to to um, show or to try to get uh, people in contact with uh, religious questions um, and man, many of these people especially who come to see the um, cathedral in Magdeburg especially in our region where uh, about um, only 15 percent of uh, the population belongs to a Christian church come and see these uh, tourist places without any contact or idea of Christianity. And the churches can use this tourism effort um, to, to get people in contact with uh, religious things. And uh, in Magdeburg, for example, they try to do it with, with uh, cultural projects, with organ um, concerts, with all these things. And I think, therefore, it's, it's the other way around. People are there already, uh, for example, in Magdeburg, um, to see this place, and the church can use it for uh, getting people in contact with religious questions. Right, of course, the cathedral is a, an attractive place. I mean, it can be, it is, it is a signpost, right. landmark mm. as well. But uh, I wonder, um, um, or I would like to point out that you also, in your portfolio, have a completely different um, 
asset as well with the Lichtungen uh, project where you go to the rural small village parish churches and uh, stained window glasses get installed um, uh, from artists uh, produced from artists Tony Clegg for example who produced uh, windows where you attract um, people's attention via art in small places yeah? because those are the places who do not find um, tourists by themselves. Right. Yeah. Yes, this is a project which is very unique for Saxony-Anhalt. There are a lot of churches throughout uh, the country where by um, glass artists, by stained glass, new stained glass in the churches, the churches become a new uh, attraction. And um, But it's, how to say, it's a sort of... Um, grassroot project. It's not supervised by association. It comes from the, the churches or the parish churches itself. They try to attract, uh, to, to create something new in their churches. And you find, for example, the Markus Lüppert's um, windows in Gütz near um, Halle, very small village, I don't know, perhaps 500 inhabitants. And uh, um, Within this city or within this village, there is an old church with these incredible new uh, windows. Stained glass windows, yeah. And I, I saw that Hannes Langbein wants to join in and, and uh, has some remarks on that. I just think that this is a very um, good example um, uh, for the question we've been talking about in the beginning, um, how the preservation of religious heritage and the development of religious heritage actually uh, go together uh, for um, you see um, the churches um, uh, which were um, uh, which um, got the new windows were actually churches in need of preservation and um, the the preservation process actually um, was uh, the um, well the occasion um, of bringing in new art and bringing in tourism and bringing in new life um, into the churches. Um, and um, actually, um, I have the feeling I'm in Berlin, on the um, old museum, there um, used to be a phrase called all art has been contemporary. And um, so um, <laughs> actually, um, yeah. to me, it seems important that uh, as you go about understanding your heritage, and this is what we talked about, you have to know your roots. Um, you actually also have to know that all art has been a process, has been new at a certain time. And um, so um, understanding the tradition also means kind of getting into contact with the process of, you know, pr pr going further. And um, this um, seems to be a very interesting example of this project with the windows in Sachsen-Anhalt um, uh, for uh, this connection. Thank you so far. Um, at this point of our discussion, I would like to introduce uh, two projects that fit right in uh, at this point. Um, and they are, uh, they have come from the um, call for papers. Uh, there were uh, around 30 um, um, introductions or th 30 papers sent in to the advisory committee. And uh, 11 have been chosen to turn them into posters and two of these posters are being presented in these conferences um, uh, each. And now we will look at two examples, one from Frederico Dinis. He is a, um, so can we see the poster? Is that, um, <laughs> I think I will just talk, yes, talk to you while you, while the camera uh, strolls along the poster. So unfortunately, Frederico Dinis does not show us some of his performances, so there is no sound and no imagery on the poster. So it's just text. But um, it is very intriguing what he has come up with as a performer and artist and also a researcher. Um, he calls himself an intermedia composer and researcher. In 1974, he was born and um, he connects to the CEIS 20, the Center of 20th Century Interdisciplinary Studies at Coimbra University. And what he aims at is um, to get a grip on what it is that lets us connect to a place, especially places with a long history. 
And as a performer, he transforms his individual experience into a composition of sound and visual projections on site. So uh, if you um, look at his website, you will find many examples where he um, has interpretations, imagery of a certain place and projects his um, compositions to the wall and makes it a sound and visual um, well, experience. And the poster deals with the research aspect of it and drawing from his artistic and aesthetic experiences. The title is Representation of Memory and the Deconstruction of the Sense of Place in Religious Heritage. And he uses philosophical and neuroscientific approaches to explain how we would individually connect ourselves to places, what it makes us, what makes us feel at home, what makes us relate to an architecture and how it influences and is influenced by memory. And here I quote from his introduction, so from the abstract on the, on the poster itself. The study explores some of the concepts related to sense of place and memory and how place permeates much of our thinking of the processes that move us between past and present, community and individual. So the poster makes no reference to this to his own performances, but they can be found in the net, in the internet. It's very inspiring, dwelling deep into our human experience. And the second one, the second um, example, the second poster we will look at uh, next is uh, sent was sent in from Huang Zhang. And um, it's about the Si Qingling Temple. I tried to figure out the right pronunciation. I hope I got it right. Please excuse if I didn't. Um, <coughs> it is a, a work from Guilin University and the site is right there at Guilin. Um, it is a special karst landscape and the temple area is probably surrounded by the city now but has been a little aside from the temple when it was uh, built. There are very few written documents of the place, but um, as you can see uh, on the left of, um, of the poster now, there is, um, a, it is a vast territory, 250 square kilometers as far as I <laughs> understood. Uh, so there is a lot of um, building sites, but the main thing here is that um, Wang Zhang found out that the landscape itself is part of the concept. So it is as the sculptures that have remained um, during time and the existing structures or building structures, it is the landscape that plays a, an important role in that kind of architecture and in the spiritual design of the whole place. And it dates back as far as the 6th century AD. Tang dynast dynasty in, in China, the very early Buddhist um, area uh, or Buddhist era, the first Buddhist period um, of the place. And it has specific uh, details, specific um, design um, elements that only appear there and not in the northern part where you can find um, old temples, Buddhist temples as well. So his research, sorry, his research helps to rediscover the dimension of early Chinese Buddhism, to raise awareness not only to Buddhism in general within the Guilin communi community, but also to its specific Chinese history and tradition. So um, this was, of course, sparkling the interest, or sparking the interest of the committee um, for very different reasons. Um, now let's come back to the panel here with these approaches. Uh, it, on one side it shows it is always about religious and cultural heritage, as I understand. So these two aspects really are deeply connected to each other. Um, and two different, very, very different approaches towards this heritage. Um, does it relate to any of your work? Stefan, would you, or Stefan Bayer, or? <laughs> In contact with the technique. Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So I thought, I thought you would uh, put up your hand. So, um, 
there are very diff different implications if you look at these two very different approaches. Um, can you relate to that um, from your perspective? Is that something you would like to um, introduce into your field of work as well? Um, or maybe um, we can relate to, to China uh, or, you know, FRH race, uh, of obviously has um, sparkled some interest or sparks interest as far as, as China. So um, it's not only the European perspective that is being um, uh, dealt with here. It is probably a, a unique human interest to, to preserve heritage uh, mm. worldwide. And mm. it's not just yeah. a regional or a European interest. <laughs> I think there um, is one uh, aspect more. Um, if I see on my own monastery, my, my own monastery, <coughs> uh, Lenin, it's, it's uh, in, uh, not far away from, from Berlin, and um, there is also an educational aspect. We have there uh, a lot of uh, school classes from Berlin. Uh, they uh, visit visiting uh, um, that monastery. And if you have a, a school class from uh, from Berlin, it's normally that you have uh, also um, migrants also from from Islamic uh, countries, and it's very interesting to to bring them uh, the European culture uh, nearer. And uh, so we have an uh, aspect; it, it it works on the on the whole world to to bring people together and to speak about their own identity and to bring them that identity also uh, to, to understanding for other people. Hannes Langbein. Um, and talking about the interreligious dialogue, actually, um, I have the feeling that um, the, the field of the arts is actually quite interesting. Uh, we once had a, um, a project at the Humboldt University in um, Berlin, or still have it actually, um, where we uh, ask ourselves, uh, might the arts actually be um, an important field of dialogue for different religions? Usually religions um, talk with one another uh, on the, uh, let's say, dogmatic field about different kinds of, you know, formulating your faith. Um, and in the ethical field. Um, so um, you talk about different ways to live and you find com common sense, uh, maybe uh, this is uh, the, the, the easiest part actually in the ethical field, but then there is also, um, if you look at, at the aesthetics, at, at the artistic field, you have a, a completely different way to communicate and you have, um, let's say, um, people who go at religious traditions with a much more open mind and a sense for re reformulation, at, as we said in the beginning. And so um, uh, I have the feeling that actually for the inter-religious uh, dialogue, the field of culture and arts is actually an important one. That's a very good point. And I, if that is possible, I would like to come back to Sabine Fahayen, who hopefully is still with us on her screen. Um, and uh, just some figures who, that will illustrate uh, your point for the German situation. We have round about 50,000 places of worship. Um, most of them are actually Christian churches, but uh, already 2,500 Muslim places of worship in Germany, mosque, 900 mosques and 133 synagogues to name a few. I mean, we did not talk about Buddhist temples or places of worship, which exist as well, uh, just to name the Abramitic um, religions here. So um, I wonder if uh, in the EU, in the um, committee, these interreligious aspects are being discussed and um, how the Muslim part is represented in the, um, in the committee. Sabine Verheyen, are you there? Uh, ah. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. As, as, as you know, the, uh, the European Union as such is not discussing religion because uh, we have some very secular member states like France and others. Uh, but what we do have, for example, in our political group is that we have interreligious dialogues 
where we really discuss also on, on, on these issues. What we are discussing in the cult committee mainly when we discuss about cultural heritage is um, uh, the freedom of religion and the respect for uh, religious places and uh, that people must have places where they can live their religion and that this is also part of our heritage especially when it comes to, to um, uh, uh, questions like migration. We have uh, um, uh, people in the committee from different religious backgrounds. Um, so uh, there is a representation when it comes to the discussions on this. Uh, we have also exchanges. Um, we had them in the past uh, um, also with uh, representatives, but it is mainly done um, on the uh, political level um, and, and not on the committee level. On the committee level, we have to discuss about the possibilities we have out of the, of the structures um, of the European Union to support uh, 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 places of worship and, and, and um, uh, cultural, uh, religious heritage places. Um, you, you brought some examples on how culture can support um, a religious dialogue. I can just give you um, one example from an artist in my region. Um, he is uh, uh, um, coming from, from Syria. He is uh, 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 working with um, Arabic uh, scripture, uh, but he is comparing, for example, text parts of the Torah, text parts of the Bible, and text parts um, of um, um, of the um, Quran. Uh, sorry of the Quran. Quran. Yes. Um, Quran. And you see, when you look at the at the calligraphic, just on the at, on the art side, you see uh, what is more that we have more in common than in different. Even you can, a difference. Even you cannot read the text because it's in Arabic uh, 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 scripture. Uh, you see visually out of this uh, uh, calligraphic artistic part uh, where we we have combinations where we have um, uh, uh, similar um, uh, aspects similar words using in in our text and I think that is also a kind how art can help uh, to foster uh, uh, interreligious dialogue um, it is important that we support these different places and approaches also from the European Union side because it belongs to our societies. But as I said at the beginning, the problem for us on the European level is that these things are uh, not explicitly laid down in the treaties, um, that uh, 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 these things fall mainly under the responsibility of the member states because we have big differences between the member states, how we deal with um, religious cultural heritage side, with religious traditions, with religion as such, uh, when it comes to, to, to state or governmental support. Uh, if you take a look, like I already said, to France, uh, there you have uh, uh, really different approaches. Um, but on the other hand, you saw also when Notre Dame was burning down, uh, how directly also the government was supporting and trying to, to help and to find solutions for this. And uh, I think that is something we have really to discuss on also um, when it comes to the uh, to the uh, um, uh, to the to the um, legacy of the European Year of Cultural Heritage, how we can include also these things into uh, our policies when it comes to uh, religious uh, cultural heritage. We've supported, for example, from European side, also uh, monastery ways connection between monasteries, uh, where people could go from one monastery to the other by car, by foot, uh, uh, hiking or going by bicycle. We uh, elaborated tours. We have the possibility with the European um, um, uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, um, initiative, yeah. initiative uh, where you can have um, 
uh, a qualification to to be the European cultural heritage, not just UNESCO, to have also steps in between. And I think there are many things uh, we are discussing and doing. Uh, but I think what's what's need, what's the new need now is also that in the discussions on the legacy on the European Year of Cultural Heritage, we have a special aspect also in the cult committee on uh, the religious heritage we have. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's an that's, um, important point as well. But one thing I would like to, to focus on now is also the limitations of, um, of use or reuse. Um, is everything okay that uh, brings in the money I asked before? But um, maybe you have some examples where, you, where suge suggestions were made or where investors had come up who, who proposed to use a church or an old chapel, a derelict uh, little building, as something completely different, as a, f I don't know, as a garage, or <laughs> I have no idea. Um, you probably have examples of that kind where you would have to say, no, this is not, um, we can't allow this because it's too far away from what we try to preserve or what we aim at as a cultural or religious heritage. Sometimes it's so intertwined it cannot be separated. Do you have examples um, where there were suggestions where you had, or some art project of um, Hannes Langbein where you would say, no, thank you, we would not, um, we cannot allow it on in our church. Are there limitations? Well, of course, uh, there are limitations. I mean, in uh, in our uh, church, it would just simply be, um, it must still be possible to have worships. <laughs> so, I mean, since we are still a living church, uh, um, it, it must be uh, possible to, um, to, to have worships in terms of space. The space must be open in terms of atmosphere uh, that you are still uh, able to, um, well, um, have a silent space and be able to listen to music and be uh, get into an inward connection. And um, what and I mean, many people uh, coming to to a church room, my feeling is, um, are looking for some kind of an oasis or a shelter. Uh, and um, uh, if there are projects uh, which completely contradict this character. Um, I uh, have the experience that it's getting difficult, but at the same time there are other people who say, um, no, um, it's, it's not the silence, it's not the shelter I'm searching in a church, uh, but I am I'm looking for a confrontation, for a provocation. I want to be kind of, you know, drawn out of my daily routines. I want to um, be be confronted by um, by uh, by um, thoughts and um, maybe by um, aesthetic impulses which which uh, draw me out of my daily daily routines and so um, there are different um, different expectations uh, concerning a church space. Of course, I mean, you could go far and say a church cannot be a restaurant, a church cannot be a, um, a swimming pool or whatever, but even even this can, can I mean, religious experience is, uh, is possible in many contexts, um, but, um, but for us, we say you still have to have worships. Right. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, I would like to um, say that I, I think you cannot generalize this, the answer on this question. I think you have to look at every case for itself. Um, and for example, I know play, um, an example from a hometown uh, near Kassel, where there is a church built in the 50s. From the 17th on, it wasn't, was no more in use. And now there is a garage inside, exactly. And uh, in the tower, there are apartments. And it somehow works because this church doesn't have any more any connection to to uh, worship or to um, a religious community. Um, I think in perhaps when you want to uh, generalize this question somehow in general, you could say every new use that has that deals with culture, education, or music is probably appropriate in a church because churches were always places where of education and culture and there is there are always um, artworks inside churches so this connects uh, very well i think this is probably the only general new use you uh, could um, could see 
What about the performing arts or political sessions? I mean, as I've mentioned that uh, Hannes Langbein uh, was born in Jena at a time where it was behind the you know iron bars, um, iron curtain, um, and um, has experienced uh, churches as places of fierce discussion uh, during the revolutionary years. And this whole area um, had um, experienced or went through a time where the churches were the the um, the safe haven for any kind of development of societal engagement, um, and were you know provoking uh, features against state or against the the politics um, represented by the GDR. So um, can it also be a place of say um, theatrical or provocation of political discussion um, or do you think there is a perspective in that f for churches? Well yes of course I mean uh, you mentioned the GDR times obviously I, I mean I was a child in this I was uh, 11 when the wall came down uh, but I uh, um, as you said I um, experienced the churches in in the former GDR um, as open spaces for um, political dis discussions and for uh, different um, groups in society. I mean, um, uh, maybe we have to be careful to um, uh, to well uh, define church spaces too quickly. Um, I mean, if uh, there is a, a, a big church in Prenzlau, for example, in Brandenburg, um, which which um, uh, which had some med medieval rules saying don't uh, drive your um, your kutsche, your <laughs> your basically your horse and through yeah. the through okay. the church room <laughs> while while there is a worship, and so you 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 already get a feeling for uh, I mean what kind of life and being a marketplace and whatever. I mean, there, there have, have, been, have been so many uses for church rooms uh, in history, which were actually in line with uh, being churches, um, that we have to be uh, careful to, to uh, be too quick with saying, well, it's a quiet space, it's a silent space, and um, not a place for provocation. I, I actually love the quote by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky um, out of the great inquisitor, uh, who uh, where the Catholic priest is actually asking Jesus Christ, why did you come to disturb us and uh, so Jesus being like the the, the, the ultimate disturber uh, of our of our world and uh, in taking this serious you could imagine all kinds of different uses for for church space um, talking about confrontation and provocation and you know being in dialogue with society um, so um, I mean um, also to, uh, looking at the arts with our Joseph Beuys ex exhibition um, this year we um, uh, you, all, um, you always have to keep in mind that also the arts are made for shaping society. It's uh, the soziale plastic, um, and this is also part of what we're doing as a church. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, um, I realized FRH as a, a platform for discussing all that questions. Um, I learned some years ago that um, in, in, in Great Britain it is possible in the Church of England to camp in, in the inside of a church. And uh, last year I heard uh, it's also possible in Germany, in, in Thuringia. I was very surprised about it because in my first uh, uh, mention I, I, I think it's not possible in Germany. And then I heard, yes, it's also uh, possible here. Uh, I think uh, it's every time a f question of the situation of the specific church and th the specific side of the parish of using that church and there is more possible than uh, we can imagine. Uh, yeah, pl please inquire before you bring your tent though <laughs> 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 to, to the church, to your local church. <laughs> yeah, but uh, okay, yeah, that's a, an important aspect that uh, there are more possibilities than we probably know um, along uh, Europe and beyond. Um, before we draw the conclusions of this conference today, um, we have another little video inspiration which fits right in because we've so far talked a lot about the material substance of heritage and there also is of course the intangible um, heritage and processions or um, you know um, customs uh, that come into it that make up a, a, a large part of heritage as well. 
and Yuli Arts is working for Parkum. It's a museum and center of expertise for religious art and culture at Flanders in Belgium. And um, she talks about the importance of intangible uh, cultural heritage, the ICH, and we'll listen to her. Yuli Ars, it's your time now. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Julie Aert and I work for Parkum. I will speak about a safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage, which means traditions and customs to ensure a future for religious heritage in a secularized society. Intangible cultural heritage is about living heritage. It's about customs, traditions like processions in order of Our Lady, the Holy Heart, but also craftsmanship in monasteries like making cookies, uh, music traditions, Iftar meals in um, Islamic community, well, it's, there are a lot of religious traditions, but they're all about people, about the heritage community involved. People are the ones who carry the tradition. In Dutch, we have a very nice word for that, which is traditie dragers, ones who carry it in literal sense. Intangible culture heritage, or ICH, is always strongly connected with the heritage community practicing it. It is also always dynamic. That means that it can change um, in other times or in other places, it will not say the same. It's dynamic, it's continually um, changing and there's an evolution. ICH in religious context or in the context of religious heritage is very relevant in changing social context as we will see in this presentation. Well, let's start about the basics. As you probably all know, the UNESCO Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Cultural Heritage of 2003 this convention was very new and uh, was very important to ensure a future for ICH. Uh, before, there was only attention for buildings, for objects, but now ICH and the people connected with the communities are becoming important. Um, and we don't speak about protecting. Protecting means that you keep it as it is, but about safeguarding. Safeguarding is a more dynamic approach and means communication, but also sensibilization, like communicating making people aware of the importance of their ICH and transmission to future generations. Because if you, there is no transmission, uh, ICH will die and it cannot continue. So that's an important point. Who is Parkum? Because Parkum um, is working on that. We are a museum and expertise center for religious art and culture in Flanders, Belgium. We try to empower communities to create support and a future for their custom and traditions. So. We are not the ones who are going to keep the tradition alive, but we help them, we support them, we inspire them. We have like a process guidance by safeguarding the ICH. We work together with the community and make, for example, a SWOT analysis or help them to think about safeguarding measures. We also guide our ICH communities towards the National Inventory of Intangible Cultural Heritage in Flanders, which is a first step if later on they want to get on the um, international um, UNESCO uh, safeguarding list or representative lift. We try to work from an integral heritage approach. That means that we not only think about the tradition or the ICH, but also what are the objects connected with building. For example, if you have a parish church that is closing and there is a procession connected to this church, you need to look for a solution for um, the procession. Otherwise, um, it will not uh, longer exist. But ICH is also a very nice mean to foster dialogue between different groups and societies. And I will give some examples about that. We have some different projects of Handen Gedragen, the Pilgrim's Table, uh, Ifter Meal. I will just uh, speak about them very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. First one is Op Handen Gedragen. This is Dutch for carried on hands. It's a network we have uh, about processions in Flanders. There are more than 700 processions in Flanders going on today. They are very widespread, they can be very big, they can be very big, like the Holy Blood procession in Bruges, but it can also be a very small procession with candles in a little village. We bring them together so that they can exchange expertise on their safeguarding, help each other with practical matters and inspire each other. We have a network day every two years and we also have other events. Uh, we edit a brochure with some practical examples. We also have the Pilgrim Stable in St. Julian's Hospital in Antwerp, which is a tradition that uh, already comes from the Middle Ages, but is still going on today. Every year on Holy Thursday, um, a table is there um, 
for with with uh, food for uh, lonely people or people who come from with a difficult who, who are poor or lonely um, in Antwerp. They are twelve according to the twelve apostles, but people can also come and look at the table before people are having dinner. Um, and this is a very widespread tradition. It is connected with uh, with new traditions uh, as the. Uh, housing of pilgrims who are from Antwerp or from other places on their way to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. So that's very beautiful. And that's the dynamic approach. You, sing, you see that the um, old tradition is connected with new traditions and that you bring different groups in the city of Antwerp together around this heritage. Another example are the St. Anthony celebrations. All over Flanders, um, people celebrate St. Anthony um, in January. Um, there are some different customs. It can be a mass or a procession, but also the selling of the head of the pig. Um, and then the benefit of this sell is for the poor people. That's another way of bringing people together around their heritage. People who are not really connected on religion or religious heritage are connected on this uh, story. Um, they come together, they help each other, and it builds social cohesion in a society, in a local society. Another example are multi-faith tours we are organizing from Parkim. There you have, uh, for example, a mosque, but also an Orthodox church, a Protestant church that um, schools or other people can visit and members of the church are explaining there about their traditions and customs. It's a very good way to foster dialogue, to bring people together and to talk about what is really important to them without any ideology or whatever, but just talking about their heritage, about their traditions. Hemelsbreed is another project where we put together uh, all the recognized religions in Flanders and found out that also their intangible heritage is very important and that we have to bring people together around their heritage. So I've come to my conclusion. Um, safeguarding ICH is really a way for heritage communities to enter into dialogue with each other to think about their ICH, how they do it uh, with society and with heritage itself. There is a an interaction necessary between the preserving the core of a tradition and search for new forms of expression. For example, with the procession, what is really important, what is the key part and what can change according to new circumstances, new people. This dynamic approach is very necessary to keep intangible heritage alive and to ensure the safeguarding. It is still relevant today and we can sure assure a future for this heritage. Well, I would like to talk a lot more about this because I'm really passionate about uh, ICH, and I think it's beautiful working in that, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have so much time. So I just thank you for listening to this small presentation. Here you have my email. Whenever you have any question or you want to talk with me about ICH in the context of religious heritage, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Bye. Yes, and that was an inspiring uh, presentation from Julia Arts, and thank you for that. Um, with um, regard to the time, the little time left for all of us to, to uh, con on this conference, I would turn once more uh, at the end of our sessions to Sabine Verheyen um, uh, there in the outer space on WebEx, <laughs> not in this room, uh, and ask her, I mean, this uh, intangible cultural heritage, it is a vast dimension of activities that could be done, that might be done, um, apart from all the substance, the building, the architecture, and all the, the statues and the, the artifacts that should be preserved and, you know, should be education um, uh, around it. But um, as, uh, as you, as a chairwoman of um, culture and education in the EU Parliament, um, of that committee. Um, what exactly would you expect from a network like the FRH to focus on now? Where, where would you suggest uh, main focus of attention or action uh, in this network? Let me ask you uh, this way around. Coming from a, a European perspective, I think for me it would be important also to elaborate where traditions, uh, intangible uh, cultural heritage, 
um, has um, a relation to, to, to other traditions and uh, religious structures. Uh, for example, when it comes to processions, when it comes to, um, to, to special events, when it comes uh, to the Easter uh, uh, traditions we have in different countries, which are also similar uh, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, which have differences, but also similarities. And to elaborate uh, the things we have in common on the one hand, but also the things that are specific for the different European regions, that would be something from the European perspective that should or could be discussed, because that would help, help also to get a societal understanding for each other how uh, things elaborated, how things developed, um, why societies are like this or are like that, um, uh, is uh, very often depending also on, on such traditions and uh, especially uh, intangible cultural uh, religious heritage. And uh, I think um, to, to raise a better understanding and to have, net, to have a network that uh, elaborates on this, um, uh, could help also to bring together uh, people all over Europe. Thank you very much, Sabine Verheyen. And with that, I would like to turn to the panel for a final conclusion tour, so to say. So um, what are the inspirations or maybe ideas that you pick up in your field of work or in your institution from the sessions we've just had from the conference? Are there already some sparks or ideas to take home with you? <laughs> Who starts? <laughs> Who wants to begin? <laughs> uh, I, I want to come back to the uh, words of, of Jan Jaspers in the beginning video. Um, he uh, said that um, one uh, goal have to, has to be uh, to know the heritage, to know our heritage. And I want to go one step more mm -hmm. and would say um, that what uh, FRH does is um, not only to know our heritage, to know also the heritage in our surrounding. And that I think that's, uh, um, like um, Sabine Fein mentioned that too, that's a, a big task uh, to, to come together in Europe and um, to know what happens in other countries. And uh, I'm very happy uh, also to, to hear that words of Sabine Fein that we that we have in our Future for Religious Heritage in our association a partner in the European Commission or in European Parliament Committee. and in the uh, Commission of CALT. Mm -hmm. That's... Uh, committee, yeah. Yeah, an, or the committee of, uh, in CALT. I, I think that's uh, the best result we can have uh, from that conference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, are there uh, specific or concrete things that you think I could, that you could do uh, in your league, in your institution, foundation, anything that um, that you think maybe with uh, regards to the next conference in four weeks' time, is there something that you want to achieve within the next four weeks for your point of work or you want to emphasize or do more of or do less? <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's also the uh, results of the um, work group that was um, presented by Jan Jasper, important, the three aspects, uh, knowledge, which I would translate into research for our institution, um, education, and on this base, the possibility of um, changing the place and uh, create a new religious heritage, and that this is allowed to do, to add something new in our time. Um, this aspect uh, for me is very important or a important result of this um, conference for our work because in a way it confirms what we try to do from another perspective and especially um, usually in our work the protection is the main goal this is what we are made for the foundation has to protect but um, from this base, uh, it, that it's also allowed to um, change and to um, add new heritage to the old heritage, 
um, is a very interesting aspect for me. Thank you. And I, I have understood that uh, Hannes Langwein is not yet a member of FRH. Um, <laughs> maybe is that an idea that you have uh, gathered uh, from this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> might, might also be an, uh, a good idea. Um, uh, however, um, um, personally, I, Sabine Fahayan also made me think when she said um, uh, that uh, the European Union um, cannot act on the level of religion, but it can um, act on the level of culture and um, so um, to me it seems that um, uh, culture seems to be a, a very important field and part of culture is artistic life and everything um, for um, not only for the dialogue between the religions the different religions which are present in in uh, in Europe but also with secular secular life I mean as we talked about it um, uh, concerning the dialogue uh, the, the the tourism um, topic, for example. And um, so it seems to me that um, the cultural field is an important field, not only to keep religious um, heritage uh, alive, but then also to, as um, Dr. Philipson just said, uh, to develop it further. And, um, and uh, well, also the possibility um, for the state to, um, to accompany this process uh, on this level uh, if the religious um, level is, is not the level they can act on. So thank you very much for all your attention and contribution. And I have uh, noted down one of the sentences from Yuli Arts. People are the ones who carry the tradition um, and people are the ones who forward uh, the goals of FRH. So um, the the call from ba uh, Pilar Balam Bahamond in the beginning was join us. And maybe this is a good um, good call for the end of this conference as well. So wherever you are as participants of this conference um, and uh, members of FRH or affiliates of FRH, uh, I think uh, there was a lot of inspiration involved here to um, how you can act, how you can make tradition work or become a tradition or a new aspect of religious heritage. And... Um, um, thank you uh, all here on this panel. Thank you, Dr. Christian Philipsen. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Herr Hannes. Entschuldigung, <laughs> there is no doctor there. Hannes Langbein and Stefan Bayer, and also Harald Schwillers, who have contribu contributed to the um, uh, conference, and Jordi Malarak uh, back in Brussels uh, behind the scenes and behind the screens. And these. Uh, technicians here in the room there are three of them that you don't see but uh, without them this whole thing would not have worked so thank you Alex, Uwe and Guido is that right I hope um, I got the names right the first names at least so thank you for that and uh, before you switch off um, your screens and leave this virtual or real room we have a last greeting from Michael Stein, and it is a musical greeting of a special kind. You can listen to sounds now that you may have never listened to before. It is a music coming from a water-driven music machine. It was designed by the engineer and inventor Salomon de Kaus in the early 17th century and built by engineers of the Aachen, Sabine Verheyen, Aachen University more than 350 years later, so in the year 1998. And it is situated right next in the next building to, to this barn where we are sitting now. It's a unique construction designed for Heidelberg Castle Gardens but never installed there due to the 30 years war. The machine now is an exhibit of Michael Stein Museum and the composition was inspired by the ancient Greek myth of Polypheme and Galatea. So enjoy this demonstration of the um, resurrection of a technical um, musical machine. Au revoir, tot ziens, in four weeks time at the FRH conference at Brussels and goodbye und auf Wiedersehen from Kloster Michaelstein in Saxony-Anhalt. Bye-bye.